good. We're going to touch upon complexation reactions now. We didn't do that last week. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. we didn't do that. Now, complexation reactions, the overarching point here is it's to do with solution color. So you already know complexation reactions very well. All we're doing now is we are delving into what it truly is. I'm sure all of you have seen reactions where color change is observed, right? Do you remember you looked at potassium thiocyanate and you looked at spectroscopy for potassium thiocyanate in your mod 5 exam? We did a question on that. And if you remember, certain solutions have specific distinct colors. Complexation theory simply explains why the color of solutions changes and how precipitation actually happens in detail. So that's what we're going to touch upon now. This is pretty much adding one level of detail to what you already know about solubility and solution colors. Does that make sense to everyone? So this is simply going to be explaining why copper is blue in solution, why it forms specific precipitated colors. Now, when a metal dissolves in water, or not dissolves in water, but when a salt dissociates in solution and ionizes and it releases its ions, you're going to have a metal cation and you have a non-metal anion. So let's say we're looking at copper sulfate. Everyone with me? When it ionizes in solution, you know you release copper 2 plus and SO4 2 minus, right? And we know the characteristic color of copper is blue. And that's the depth to which you currently know it. What I'm going to add upon now is how the copper interacts with the water and how it forms a complex. So let's first define what a complex is. A complex has two components. There is always a central metal cation. And this is usually a transition metal. Iron 2, iron 3 are some key examples of them. So let's say I have a solution of iron chloride. Iron chloride. And let's say it's iron 3 chloride. You know that when it ionizes in solution, we'll release iron 3 ions and chloride ions. Good. Now, what's going to actually happen is this iron 3 does not exist by itself in aqueous state. Thorne, what is it surrounded by in solution? What's the iron surrounded by? Yeah. Just think about visually, if it's in water, what molecule is it surrounded by? The um, negative charge in water, the partially negative. Yeah, good, good. So it's surrounded by water molecules. That's the key thing I was looking for. And what happens is we get a coordinate covalent bond forming. Okay, this iron is positively charged. Thorne is completely right. It attracts the, the electronegative end of the, the water molecule, the negative pole. And what actually happens is, if you can imagine H2O, H2O has this particular structure here. And how many lone pairs does it have, Arik, at the oxygen end? Two. Two lone pairs, very good. Now we get a special kind of bond where the water molecule will face the iron three and it will donate both electrons of the electron pair, one of its electron pairs, to form a special kind of covalent bond. What do we call a covalent bond where both the electrons come from one atom? Coordinate covalent bond, yeah. Very good. So it's a coordinate covalent bond. So the molecule that's surrounding the central metal cation, in this case it was water, that is what we call a ligand. So what's going to happen is we are going to get water molecules forming, forming coordinate covalent bonds with this iron 3. And we characteristically always draw six ligands around a central metal cation. So what's actually happening to this iron 3 in solution, if you look at the molecular interactions, is you form multiple coordinate covalent bonds between a ligand and a central metal cation. Now, the ligand is either an ion itself or it is a polar substance. So it's a polar molecule or it even can be an ion sometimes. Now, what would be the net charge of this entire complex? We use big brackets such as this to represent we're talking about the overall complex. What would the charge be here? Let me just take the three plus out. You wouldn't write it inside, you'd write it 
at the top here. So whenever you are writing IN3 in your books, what you're actually referring to in a simplified form is this complex here. Does that make sense to everyone? So we're just delving deeper into what the molecular interactions are. So one common exam question you can get is to draw a complex and its components. So be ready to do that. Good. Any questions, Arik? Uh, so isn't this like technically like hydration spheres, basically, in a sense? Is it like hydration spheres? Do you mean like, like, when you, like when you have to explain like dissolution and all that, you have to like draw those like hydration spheres. It looks similar in a sense. You mean like because a... Mycel, is that what you're referring to? Uh, oh no, I'm like referring to like the water of crystallization, where it's like when you dissolve like a ionic compound, for a sense, you get like the ion dipole attractions and all that. Mm. So is it's, it like similar to that? It is similar, but you wouldn't call this a hydration sphere. Uh, you could, you okay. can call this a hydration sphere. You're right because there are water molecules surrounding it. But I wouldn't use that terminology just because there's a bit of gray area into how we use those terms. So I do know students who've written hydration spheres and micelles and used it interchangeably, and it has cost them marks depending on their teacher, right? So I would just be a bit cautious using micelle. I would not use micelle here. This is not a micelle, but you could call this a hydration sphere. But the correct term is it's a complex. And the reason it's a complex, okay. we have the two components of a complex. Number one, Kushal, what was the what were the two components of a complex we just mentioned? Um it was the the metal ion and the ligand. Yeah, metal ion and the ligand. Very good. So now I'm going to explain to you what happens when iron three combines with another compound. So right now we're at that stage we have iron three ions. And let's say it combines with hydroxide ions. Do we form a precipitate? That is my first question. Nielsen, yes or no? Uh, we, we don't. No, we do, we do. Oh, we do. So the way we break this down is, Nielsen, I've taught you your solubility table oh, in terms right, of... Right, right, right. Yeah. So forget the ion three for now. Think about your anion and ask yourself, was hydroxide in that table which was soluble anions or was it in the insoluble anion table? It's in the insoluble. Yeah, so what were the exceptions for hydroxide? It was your universal yeah, rule. Anything which... with the plus one charge and the twins, the CA. Oh, okay. Very good. So, Neoj, you should have had that in red in your book because you, you didn't mention that. Group one metals and ammonium are always soluble, no matter what ion. Here, this is not group, it's a transition metal. And barium and calcium are the other exceptions. So in this case, we have not broken the exception to hydroxide, so it is insoluble. And so we get FeOH3. That's what you're going to write in your exams until now. If they ever ask for a complexation reaction representing this, I'll show you what's actually happening. What did we say? We said the iron 3 isn't naked like this. It actually exists surrounded by how many water molecules did we say again? Six. Yeah, very good. Good, so surround it with six water molecules. Remember, the overall charge is simply the charge of the, the metal ion, which is three plus. And you wouldn't write the three plus in the spheres I because you want to represent the overall charge as this. Oh, yes, you're completely right, Darren. It is FeOH3. Good, thank you. Good, so that should be FeOH3. And I'm going to explain to you what this looks like when we do the complexation reaction. So another question you can get is write complexation reactions. You would never write a complexation reaction unless they ask you for it, okay? So here and here, this would be three. Good, thanks, Tharun. So here what happens is you have the three hydroxide ions. And what's going to happen is, why do we do six hydroxide ions? It's, it's more convention more than anything, Shriji, because there can be more than six water molecules surrounding the Fe, but we just represent six to show what it looks like um, when we have our complex. So there is, in actuality, it's... more than six water molecules. Okay. Is this for, like, um the general trend, like, for all transitional metals? This is for any complex. You surround it usually with six surrounding usually. Okay. water molecules. Yeah, that's the, the When do rule. we do it with, like, different... Will they ever like tell us to do it with differently, like surrounded by five? 
No. Um, okay. You don't need to, because all you're representing here is that there are ligands that have formed coordinate covalent bonds. There's no, there's never exactly six. This is just convention to show that that is what is happening. Okay, good. Okay, so what's going to happen now is we understand three hydroxide ions are going to add across, right? So what's going to happen is three of the water molecules, is going to be three plus, are going to be replaced by the hydroxide ions. So all we're going to represent here is the exact same ion. And there's going to be three water molecules. And there's going to be three hydroxide added across. And now what's the overall charge going to be, everyone? Is it just going to be normal, like zero, no charge? Yeah, exactly, no charge. And you're just going to write the state of salt. So this is the complexation reaction. And the way you'd write it in any game, so this is the diagram. These are the diagrams. The actual complexation chemical reaction will be written like this. I'll show you. So right now we have F E H two O. How many H two O do we all have, everyone? Six. What's the overall charge of this structure here? Three points. So the big square brackets are always added at the outside, and outside of that we only add the charge. Does that make sense to everyone? Good. Now what's happening now is we've got three hydroxide adding across. And what did we say? It's going to replace the water molecules. Is everyone with me? So what's going to happen now is we're going to get Fe, H2O, three, OH, three, bracket, solid. Good. And that's what the, the actual complexation reaction should look like. And then you can drop three water molecules coming out like this due to the law of conservation of matter. So whenever in your exams, there are two main questions I'll ask you. What is a complex? That's number one. And drawing a diagram of a complex. And number two, writing chemical equations for a complexation reaction. And the principle, if you realized, was whenever I'm trying to write a complexation reaction, if I'm ever stuck, I always write the normal equation first. Then if I'm stuck further, I'll write the diagram. And I'll use both of those to help me write the complexation reaction. In actuality, you can simply go straight from the normal word equation that you know, straight to the complexation equation. As long as you remember, there are six water molecules that will surround the metal cation. And we will add hydroxide or whatever anion we will add until we obtain neutrality, where there is no charge on the outside there. Good. Any questions now? So, Tharun, question? Yeah, Um. for the end, yeah, why, why do we have to put the plus 3H2O? Why do we have to do the plus 3H2O? So, we had six but, molecules of H2O originally in this equation. Oh, okay. Popped yeah. out. So you have to represent the three that yeah, popped up. Law of conservation of mass. Thank you. Go Gibson. Question. Uh, do we have to like know the ligands for different types of metal? Metal. No, um, so the ligand is always like ninety percent of your exam questions will be water as the ligand. Sometimes, God Gibson, it can be ammonia. So they might say iron is added to ammonia solution. In that case, God Gibson, you would do the exact same thing that we've done here except mm -hmm. there will be six NH3 surrounding the iron. So connecting, uh, yeah, so here you just write NH3 instead. That'd be the only difference. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and they'd usually tell you that, let's say two hydroxide adds across the salt in ammonia solution. If that happens, you would just um, pop out two ammonia molecules and add two hydroxide. Uh, okay. Good. And Arik, question? Uh, I remember in mod five, we were looking at like cobalt chloride, like hydrated, and there was like this, I think that had like the complex reaction as well. So yes. is this like a principle yes. they were following? Yes. So the reason, yes, you're completely right. So very good pickup. The reason that you saw that funky equation with brackets and pluses was the correct way to represent colored solutions, Eric, is yeah. through a compensation equation. Because it's the uh, complex okay. that gives the, the ion that uh, particular. Does that make sense? So the reason that iron 
iron two solutions are green, iron three precipitates are brown. So this is characteristically a brown precipitate. And the reason is this particular complex will reflect light that is in the brown region of the visible spectrum. And that is why you see it as brown. All right, thank you. Good, that might be another point you might need to mention. The reason that we write this is that the complex absorbs all wavelengths of visible light and it reflects the wavelength that is its color. That's why you see a particular color. So the reason you see brown as this precipitate is the precipitate actually absorbs all colors of the visible spectrum but brown. Brown gets reflected and it enters your eye and hence you see iron 3 hydroxide is brown. It's quite interesting. What this means in reality is every object around you is actually the inverse color of what you're seeing. So Saga's blue wall is actually absorbing every color but blue. And the reason we see blue is because it's reflecting blue back at us. Yeah, so that's quite interesting. But yeah, that's the, that's the science behind complexes. So anytime you deal with a colored solution, you might get a complexation equation. Now, the best way to be comfortable around all this, because I know this is all new to all of you, you've never written one before, is do the textbook questions from infocus slash Pearson. Um, that's also in your notes. I've added quite a few complexation equations in your Mod 8 notes. And the second thing is, what else would I say that's very important? Do the trial questions on complexation. That'll tell you what they will ask you. Good. This is not too high yield. I haven't seen many exam questions on this at all. Okay, so as long as you know what a complex is and you're ready to write an equation, you're set. Good. All right, happy to move on? Sounds good. This is part of solution color. So when I told you there were three qualitative tests, there's solution color, and the way we can explain a solution's color is through complexation e equations. Number two was precipitation reactions. Know your solubility rules. Use the periodic table if stuck and memorizes flow charts. That's very important for your trials, especially. Number three, flame test. Know the method of the flame test. Know the solution colors. That's it. So that's qualitative ion analysis in a nutshell. So maybe you can try this question here. Very quickly, you'll have a minute and a half. So this will be a typical exam question you'll get. So just do two, please. Skip one, go straight to two. All right, nice. I think we're ready to go through this. Okay, so Tharan, take me through the first one. So we've got the dissolution of copper nitrate. Uh, remember, the nitrate ion doesn't contribute to anything. But what happens to the copper? So you can simply just write copper nitrate is going to form copper 2 plus ions and nitrate ions. Now tell me what happens to the copper. Um. The copper, as we said um, beforehand, doesn't that get, um, since we're, we're performing dissolution, doesn't um, it get attracted to water? Mm -hmm. And so um, we'll have water molecules surrounding the copper. Mm -hmm. And so if we, if we uh, what I did was I drew, the, I drew the big brackets first. Yeah. And then I did, I did um, four waters. Smart man. Why four? A uh, uniform shape. Yeah, but based off all the textbooks, six is the most ideal to use. Okay. It looks better when you have uh, two hydroxide. That's why. Wait, so you could have had eight if you wanted to. No, it, see, the number does not matter so much, but you should have six. I would uh, want wouldn't your... it be um, two NO3? Yeah, it is. Yes, two NO3. yes you're right. Two NO3, two NO3, and you do CU. NO3, two, arrow, and you'd also do six H2O. That's copper nitrate, and that's a complexation equation for dissolving in water. Does that make sense to us now? Yep. So we're just adding that extra level of detail to explain why we get a blue color. It's because of this complex, and this complex characteristically reflects blue light into our eyes, hence we see that particular color. Very good. No question. So, yeah. Uh, uh, so what I did was um 
Uh, what two basically said? I did see you H two O four of them and NO three two of them, and then I wrote mm -hmm. the dissolution. That that would not be correct because it hasn't formed a complex yet, right? On the left hand side, it hasn't oh. even broken up. This is pretty much the solution to interact with water at all. And on the right hand side, it's interacted with water. So you pretty much oh. have to. If you're stuck, what you do is you write the basic simple equation you always know. And then you look at the ion itself and you simply will add ligands across to it. That's how I use it. Okay. okay. So I guess the tips here is if you're stuck, do the basic word equation and then every single metal ion by itself, you will change it to the complex. Good. So precipitation with hydroxide ions. Right now we've got copper ions. I told you we don't care about the nitrate. That's not contributing to the color. So we're going to take that out of the equation. We've got copper two plus. And that's going to combine with hydroxide ions. How many hydroxides will it combine with? Two. Yeah, logically, if you're stuck, you write the word equation that you always know. And you remember it's two hydroxides because this is what we're trying to show, but specifically in relation to complexes. So it's two hydroxides. Very good. Okay. And what's going to happen now? Um, and then it's going to go into uh, EU. H2O, is, or uh, there's going to be four left if you can put six. Good. And? Um, OH2. Good. Uh, yes. Solid, and then uh, H2, two H2O as a... Uh, Very good. Good. And that would give Saga four marks for this question. Good job. That's it. Does that make sense to everyone? Complexes are not too hard. You're simply just showing the specific interactions of ion, uh, water molecules with the central metal cation. Now, Nielsen, what were the bonds between the ligand and the central metal cation again? Uh, they were coordinate covalent. Yes, coordinate covalent bonds. You should be ready to explain why that is. The ligand gives both its electrons to the metal cation, okay? So it's coordinate covalent bonds. Good, be ready to draw it too. Good, and on that note, we've finished qualitative ion analysis. Mm -hmm.